We're here with Raj Sivakumar, who is head of travel technology and strategy at WNS Global Services, and Peter Fader, who is a Wharton marketing professor and most recently co-director of the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. Welcome to both of you. Great to be Thank with you, Deb. So we're here to focus on the airline industry and how customer analytics has really changed that industry. So can you talk about some of the evolution of um, the use of analytics in airlines? Yeah, thanks, uh, Deborah. Um, you know, just to provide some backdrop about the airline industry, it has been perhaps one of the most distressed industries you know, uh, ever since you know, it started. And in the entire airline food chain, uh, or the travel food chain, the airlines make the least amount of profits you know, compared to the other players in the ecosystem. What that has meant, you know, putting a positive spin to that is, airlines you know, in particular have become the hotbed when it comes to innovation, technology, decision support, optimization, et cetera. Okay? And if you look at any leading sort of a decision support system, you know, it's safe to say that the airlines have led the way. Okay? Whether it's a frequent flyer program, whether it's a revenue management system, whether it's a scheduling system, et cetera. And because necessity is the mother of invention. Now, where this all fits in from an analytics standpoint is, in the early days of decision support, analytics played a supporting role. Okay? So as revenue management, for example, sort of you know, got enhanced, okay, clearly the advanced revenue management systems required better data. It required more accurate data. Okay? But there was very little personalization. It was, you know, just to talk about airline parlance here, it's looking at PNRs as opposed to looking at customers. It is looking at the travel records as opposed to looking at the customers. So while the data collection and the data uh, enforcement, so to speak, has been there right from the beginning, what we have seen in the last, I would say, five years or so, is more of an emphasis on personalization, okay? Understanding the customer more, okay? Understanding the attributes of the customer more. Talking about, you know, what is it that we can glean, you know, from the data that we've observed, not just from that customer, but also from the class of customers that look like that customer. Okay? And that evolution is pretty marked. And clearly that evolution has become you know, more prominent, not only because you know, of the advanced analytical techniques, but also because of the advanced data gathering techniques and the technology that is available for us to parse the data. And I want to highlight what Raj said, which is uh, every other industry owes such an incredible debt of gratitude to the airline industry as he said, uh, they truly led the way. Like, for instance, you look at loyalty programs today, we all take them for granted. They're ubiquitous. Think about how many different programs you belong to. But every one of those programs, uh, in a way, is, is paying homage uh, to the, the airlines. Uh, they did it first, they did it best, and it continues to be a major strategic weapon there. Uh, and on a very personal level, I spend a lot of my time these days um, looking at, uh, at, at revenue management or the, the notion of dynamic pricing. In fact, I just completed a, a, a paper where we applied different uh, dynamic pricing techniques to a major league baseball club. Uh, something like that would have been unthinkable 5, 10, 20 years ago. And it really was the airlines who not only brought those words into our vocabulary, but legitimized them uh, and made it possible that, indeed, different people could pay different prices for the very same product, and they made it acceptable, and they made it profitable. Uh, and so the, and it's in, incredible, the, those two things alone, loyalty programs and dynamic pri pricing, are really game-changing for every industry, and, it, and it's remarkable that they, 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 those innovations, among many others, come from one industry. As airlines increasingly adopt data analytics tools, what are key factors of success? Data analytics, you know, is about better decisions at the end of the day. And in the airline space, you know, probably more so than any other space, the decisions are all about trade-offs, okay? We are talking about, you know, we are talking about customer centricity, we are talking about revenue enhancement, and we are talking about cost reduction. And more often than not, you know, these three objectives are conflicting, you know, as opposed to, you know, collaborating, if I can say that, right? So it is absolutely crucial that the scientists and the practitioners in who focus on data analytics understand the trade-offs well. Because at the end of the day, we got to sell data analytics program or practice and make it viable in the industry. And those airlines and those practitioners that are able to understand the trade-offs well are the ones that are going to succeed at the end of the day. 
What Raj says is deceptively simple, but actually much more complex to actually implement. This idea of trade-offs, which I completely agree with, it sounds simple. In fact, we've had statistical techniques for decades that are going to let us measure the trade-offs and understand how people will, will make those and how they'll vary across people and how different kinds of contextual factors such as marketing messages might impact those trade-offs. So from a pure measurement standpoint, it's easy. That's a solved problem. But from implementing, from building a business, not just to accommodate those trade-offs, but to build it entirely around those kinds of trade-offs. The idea of taking customer centricity, instead of saying, oh yeah, we gotta be cognizant of the customer, but saying, no, that's the focus of what we do. That's what's gonna drive our analytic success. That's gonna mean much more than just having a bunch of smart people who can collect data and crunch numbers. It's gonna mean changing the corporate culture, it's going to mean changing the kinds of metrics that we use to judge the business. So instead of just looking at things like volume and overall revenue and market share, we're going to be looking at metrics such as customer lifetime value and customer retention metrics that by their very nature represent some of those trade-offs. Uh, it's going to mean a, a different structure to the organization. So it, it's, it's not enough just to say we, we have to embrace trade-offs. Uh, this has to come from the top down. It has to be the C-level people saying that it is these kinds of trade-offs, that is this notion of customer centricity that's going to be front and center. And in some sense, if you can get that right, then the, anal the analytical capabilities are going to follow quite naturally. Well, airlines today are making a lot of alliances with outside partners, such as hotel chains, car rental companies, and the like. But in the process, they do encounter some challenges. Can you talk about some of those challenges and how they can potentially overcome them? Sure. It's a very interesting problem. Oh. So airlines have stopped looking at themselves in isolation. They have partnerships with the other airlines. And they also have partnerships, you know, or could be having more partnership with other players in the ecosystems. You know, whether it's a car rental company, whether it's a large travel intermediary like an OTA, you know, et cetera. The challenge, quite simply, and, and from a customer standpoint, the customer de demands and deserves recognition, and the customer demands and deserves consistency in the treatment. Right? And these two become challenges as you look at how do we deal with the customer from an entity standpoint or the enterprise standpoint. And the problem quite simply is this. Okay? Every player in the ecosystem would like to own the customer, to use the parlance. And in the process of owning the customer, and the way they own the customer for the most part today okay, is through the loyalty programs the airline frequent flyer programs or the, the hotel loyalty programs or such. And the challenge there is, is to be able to have an adequate treatment on how information is exchanged, how if there is any monetary exchange of a customer that may, you know, that may travel in a, in a certain flight and stay in a certain hotel and take a certain car rental company, okay, who benefits more you know, from what treatment? Okay, because one could argue that you know, the hotel or the airline you know, brings bulk of the revenue Okay, and the car rental company plays a subsidiary role, whereas the car rental company could, could argue the other way, you know, because of their attributes is why you know, a certain person is flying or whatever the case may be. So the adequate treatment of the cross-company sort of, you know, the, the, the benefits and the value that is being transcended to the customer is going to be absolutely important you know, between, this, you know, between this company being able to recognize and reward the customer. And then how they divvy up the value. I'm not going to say revenue here. How they divvy up the value you know, that the customer brings to the ecosystem amongst themselves is going to be crucial. They're getting better at it, but a lot more work has to be done. And indeed, the idea of partnerships, uh, with airlines, it's, it, it's an idea that's been around forever. Uh, and in fact, there, there were some really bold initiatives happening long before a lot of these operational ideas uh, really uh, came to pass. So I'm thinking back 25, 30 years ago, I can't even rem remember the name of the entity, when United Airlines bought Hertz and, and Weston, and the whole idea is let, let's get all these things together. The problem is uh, those partnerships were way ahead of their time. And I'm thinking about all the words that, that Raj is using over here, the idea of customer centricity, the idea of being able to track individual customers through all those different touch points and then allocating their value accordingly to them. None of that was possible back when, let, let's stay with that one case study, when, when, when United was, was buying up certain kinds of hotels and car rental companies. At that point, there were still entirely separate databases for the customers to the extent they were tracking customers at all across the, those three players. There was no way to get that holistic view, and there was no way on any kind of personalized level to be able to, to serve up differential experiences to customers based on what they were doing with one of the other partners. 
So the partnerships ideas has been around forever, and that's it's good. It's nice to see an industry that's willing to take risks like that. But we're on the verge right now because of this belief in data, because of the belief in analytics, because of the belief in customer centricity, that these partnerships are going to start to really bear fruit. And they're going to do so in a way that's going to be synergistic to all of the partners. There's going to be just tremendous insights arising from it. Uh, and everyone's going to be better off, not only the partners involved, but the customers as well. So how can airlines best use social media and other customer level data to drive product differentiation, to boost sales, and provide a superior customer experience. Social media. That's, that's, that, that's the great unknown. That's, that's the, the, the world that we're stepping into right now. And as always, uh, airlines have been a, a truly at the leading edge of it. And it's interesting because they're at the leading edge kind of in both ways, which is on one hand, uh, being the producers, being really uh, proactive users of social media. So whether it's uh, you know hiring armies of people to monitor Twitter, and every time they tweet about your name, you know you're you're on it right away. Or uh, one of the areas I just just love about airlines, it seems like every Christmas. It seems like lots of different airlines are coming up with some, some amazing viral video about uh, how they're doing some surprise and delight, whether it was WestJet in Canada um, or uh, uh, KLM uh, uh, over in Europe. Lots of examples of airlines kind of, again, proactively using social media. But then they're also on the receiving end of it as well. Because it's an industry that, that, that creates so much passion, you're going to get uh, viral videos uh, like the, the famous United Breaks Guitars. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a famous example, but it's been amazing to see how well not just United Airlines, but the airlines in general have been doing uh, this is a kind of a judo move to take a medium that, that in some ways can be used against them, but to turn it around and turn it into a real strength. Now, in no way am I suggesting that it's game over and that they figure this thing out. But all I'm saying is that they are leading the way, and I think a lot of industries are looking at the airlines to see, in many ways, they're the canary in the coal mine to see how they're using social media. And I think in that same way, the airlines are being proactive about looking for best practices outside the industry as well. So just to add to what Peter said, um, social media is incredible you know, from a couple of different uh, standpoints. One is uh, it's a rich set of independent data source. Right. Okay. Compared to the traditional data sources that airlines are used to and other companies are used to, and secondly, they're spontaneous. Okay. And there's a there's a remarkable level of importance, you know, that has to be atta attached to the spontaneity of the data. You know, just to kind of put this in context, traditionally airlines have you know invested you know millions of dollars on conducting surveys, right? So whether in-flight survey or surveys that no nowadays come via email, you know, after the travel has happened. Hey, what do you think about the booking process? What do you think about the, the travel process, in-flight, food, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And typically these surveys are sent, you know, a you know, month later, a week later, whatever the case may be, okay? But even if the surveys are sent spontaneously, the response is about a month or two after the process happened. You know, for example, a customer may have made the booking, you know, six months ago, and now you're asking, you know, hey, how did the booking process go, right? Now with the advent of the social media, what, what it has done is, the customer is able to spontaneously respond and in a very unconstrained way, respond to a certain experience. And that provides the airlines with a very rich data source, okay, for them to think about what is the world thinking, okay, or at least a certain class of customers thinking about that particular aspect of the service, good or bad, okay? And what we are doing in WNS is, you know, there's a fair amount of investment that is going on. We have an advanced social media analytics tool, okay, that captures the footprint, social media footprint, and maps it to certain airline attributes, whether it's meals, whether it's baggage, whether it's a check-in process, okay, that and compares it with the peer group, okay. So you're able to do all this in a very unconstrained way, and that, is, that makes it incredibly powerful compared to the traditional ways. Because, when, you know, just to repeat, when you, when you kind of look at the surveys, for example, or when, even when you look at the complaint data, it's only a small fraction of the customers that actually take the trouble of complaining. The vast majority of the customers just walk with their money to some other airline, okay? Now, as you capture this in real time and you're able to respond to it in real time, you know, that puts the airlines in a better light and more importantly, increases the loyalty element as well with that customer.